This is Judy, an Australian sauropod dinosaur. Judy just made the news a few days ago because she's very special. In fact, she's provided us with a totally unique insight into sauropod ecology. And everyone is intrigued by sauropods, right? If for no other reason than that they could grow to such ridiculous sizes. Now, we've learned a lot about sauropods in recent years, but many questions remain. Among these, one of the most important is, what the hell did they eat? Were those long necks used to access food way up in the Mesozoic canopies? Or did they hold their necks more horizontally and hoover up food at low levels? Were they fussy eaters with different species adapted to browse on particular foods? Or were they voracious, indiscriminate bulk feeders on pretty much anything they could reach? Through most of the age of dinosaurs, Conifers were the dominant plant group, with flowering plants only emerging later in the picture. Did sauropods adapt to include flowering plants in their diets? These questions have long engaged paleontologists. There have been many opinions given based on analyses of their fossilised skulls, teeth and skeletons. But until now, every one of these conclusions has amounted to informed speculation. Among the nearly 300 described species of sauropod found across all seven continents, spanning at least 140 million years of the fossil record, we have never been able to describe the diet of a single sauropod with certainty. In fact, we couldn't even be 100% sure that they ate plants. But now, with a little help from Judy, we can answer these questions, and if you'd like to find out how, then keep watching. Hi, I'm Professor Steve Rowe. I'm a real paleontologist, and you're watching Real Paleontology. And today, we're talking guts, fossilised gut contents, to be precise. We call these colonites, not to be confused with coprolites, which are fossilised poo. Now, these particular colonites were found in the guts of this particular sauropod dinosaur, nicknamed Judy. And Judy was found in 95 million year old deposits near the outback Australian town of Winton, here in central Queensland. She's a subadult around 12 metres long. She represents a species called Diamantinosaurus matilde, and in her guts is the precious first ever, like in the history of the world, direct evidence of what a sauropod ate. Incidentally, if ever you're at Winton Way, you should check out the Age of Dinosaurs Museum there. It's well worth a look. Anyway, obviously, we're going to talk about what was in Judy's guts, but first, just a little bit of background. Now, Diamantosaurus was first described back in 2009 by Scott Hucknall and friends here. Now, together with other finds, including Judy, this species is the best represented sauropod in the Australian fossil record, and it's the only one for which we have a near complete skull. Described here by Stephen Porropat and colleagues in 2017, Porropat and friends have also authored the paper at the centre of today's episode, just published a few days ago here. Now, Diamantosaurus is a titanosaur, the latest surviving group of sauropods, and they included some of the largest, such as Patagotitan here, which may have grown to around 37 metres in length and nearly 70,000 kilos in weight. However, at maximums of around 16 metres and 25,000 kilograms, Diamantosaurus was not quite in this super heavyweight league. Okay, that's enough background. Let's just quickly revisit the main question surrounding sauropod diet before we dive into Judy's guts and discuss what they mean. Firstly, did sauropods primarily feed high in the canopy, at mid-level, or close to the ground, or maybe some combination thereof? Secondly, what kinds of plants did they eat? Ferns, conifers, cycads, angiosperms, or all of them. Thirdly, 
With sauropods, bulk feeders, basically, did they just swallow huge quantities of tough, low nutrient value vegetation without chewing it, and just let the microbes in their guts do the hard work through fermentation? Before Judy came along, most attempts to predict diet in sauropods were based on the study of their teeth and skulls. And this is kind of limiting because their skulls especially are pretty rare finds. The teeth come in two basic varieties, narrow and pig-like, and broad, more spoon-like teeth. Another interesting factor here is variability in the rate at which teeth are replaced, which occurs throughout life. Sauropods with pig-like teeth have faster rates of tooth replacement, and by fast we mean within a month or less in some species. Judy and other titanosaurs are part of this fast replacement club. On the other hand, the group with spoon-shaped teeth have slower replacement rates. The best known among these is probably Brachiosaurus. Interestingly, as determined by Keegan Melstrom and friends in 2021 here, this combination of simple little teeth and rapid tooth replacement rates is a totally novel kind of feeding ecology, not seen in any other herbivorous animals. It allowed them to strip or rate vast quantities of vegetation from the branches to be passed into their guts with minimal processing in their mouths. Basically, full-on bulk feeders. With respect to studies on the biomechanics of sauropod skulls, not a whole lot's been done compared to the amount done on carnivorous dinosaurs, but there certainly have been some. For example, in 2012 here, Mark Young and colleagues modelled this Diplodocus under different biting and pulling behaviours and concluded that it was well adapted for branch stripping, basically raking or combing its teeth through branches to pull leaves and shoots off and swallow them whole en masse. And in 2016, David Button and friends digitally reconstructed muscles and compared the skull mechanics of the Jurassic sauropod Camarasaurus with those of a less specialised species representing the ancestral condition for sauropods, Platiosaurus. Button and co. concluded that Camarasaurus had a more efficient and powerful bite, with a maximum bite force approaching 2,000 newtons compared to less than 200 newtons for Platiosaurus. Of course, with a maximum weight of around 4,000 kilograms, Platiosaurus was way smaller than Camarasaurus, which may have exceeded 40,000 kilograms in weight. Now, although a maximum bite force of 2,000 newtons is nothing to sneeze at in absolute terms, given the size of the animal, it's almost embarrassingly small. A T. rex could bite 20 to 25 times harder. Okay, so just to quickly recap and summarise here, based largely on differences in tooth and skull shape, tooth wear, skull mechanics, and a few postcranial features, paleontologists have argued that different species of sauropod specialised in different plants available at different heights. For more specific examples, it's been argued that the Tanzanian Giraffe Titan here selectively browsed the canopy, and at the other end of the spectrum, Nigesaurus from Nigeria most likely got down low to feed on horsetails and such. Poropat and others 2025 suggest that our Aussie Diamantinosaurus would have likely been categorised as either a middle or high level browser. Okay, so the big reveal. What did Diamantinosaurus actually eat? Well, based on clever and very high resolution imagery, including micro CT and synchrotron acquired data of what was found in her guts, we know that Judy was absolutely not a fussy eater. Poropat and colleagues found the remains of conifers, seed ferns, and flowering plants. They also determined that none of these plant materials had been chewed. So what does this mean and what have we learned? Well, firstly, given that you've made it this far through my little video, I figure you must have found it to be at least a bit interesting. And I ask that you please like and subscribe to my little channel. Costs you nothing, but it means a lot to me. 
and helps inspire me to do more videos like this. OK, back to the question. Now, at a fundamental level, Judy's gut contents show us that sauropods weren't carnivores. Big deal, some of you may say. We pretty much knew that for sure anyway. But what I say is that in science, sometimes proving the bleeding obvious is important. Judy's gut contents also confirm that she was a bulk feeder that did not chew her food and that she must have relied on fermentation to process it. It further shows that sauropods did indeed adapt to feed on flowering plants. Lastly, it shows that she accessed her food at multiple levels, from relatively high up into the canopy down to pretty low levels below. So although she may or may not have been better adapted to feed on a particular variety of plant at a particular level, she certainly was not confined to this. Now, before I wind up, we need to throw in a couple of caveats. For one, obviously, what we have here are the gut contents of one particular individual sauropod of one particular species at one particular point in her life. And we can't assume that we can universally apply what we've learned from her to all other sauropods. Porra pattern friends still make it clear that differences in anatomy between sauropod species almost certainly reflect different food preferences accessed at different preferred heights. But what Judy's gut contents suggest is that it's maybe unlikely that any was so specialised that they were entirely restricted to a particular kind of plant at a particular level. And indeed, when you think about it, this kind of has to be so. No sauropod ever busted out of its egg and started browsing high in the canopy. There never was any other option but to start low and work your way up. Hey, okay. I'll end it here. Hope you liked the show. And if you did, then just a little reminder, please like and subscribe. Maybe even send me a few bucks via the super thanks option. Either way, enjoy the rest of your day or night.